Okay, we're going to begin. Please go ahead and close the doors because the, uh, the noise level uh, interferes. Our next proposition is that China faces a looming economic crisis. After decades of breakneck economic growth, China is now the second largest uh, economy in the world. And its rapid industrialization has firmly established what was once an isolated country um, as a global production hub. And yet there have been worrying signs uh, in recent years regarding China's long-term economic prospects. Obviously, China's double-digit annual growth rates uh, are a thing of the past, but it still remains a question as to whether or not China really faces uh, a, an economic crisis that the Communist Party is incapable of managing. Many people flag problems that China faces, its rising debt to GDP ratio, capital flight, and uh, real estate bubbles, and demographic trends, and of course, the environmental concerns. Uh, but are these challenges uh, that uh, the, the party in China are unable to manage, and will China really confront a major economic crisis going forward. So once again, as you, we have to phrase these propositions in stark ways, perhaps one could argue in some ways, maybe China will face economic challenges, but it won't be a crisis. So we're gonna ask our speakers to try and define their uh, arguments uh, on this, and we're going to start first. And please, as I introduce the speakers, <laughs> if you would all vote on whether you agree or disagree. Um, to my right is Andy Xie, who is both a columnist for the South China Morning Post and a financial consultant to hedge funds and banks. And to my left is uh, David Dollar, who is a senior fellow uh, at the John uh, L. Thornton China Center at the uh, Brookings Institution. Uh, and of course, as many of you know, was the former uh, U.S. Treasury's economic and financial emissary uh, to China, 2009 to uh, 2013. So both terrific speakers. I think this is going to be a great debate. And before we start, we're going to see how you have all voted. So let's go ahead and show those results. Okay, so this is a little bit closer. We have... We have fewer than 100 votes. I don't know why there's more than 100 people in the room. We have 43% agree that China faces a loo looming economic crisis and 55% that disagree. Okay, I am looking forward to seeing how everybody will vote after the presenters are finished. And we'll start with you, Andy. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Bonnie, for having me here. And uh, certainly this is an uh, interesting time. Uh, as you know, there's Chinese proverb that says that, says that um, may you live in interesting times. I think that uh, 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 this is a, a turning point for China and uh, as well as for the, uh, the global uh, economy. Uh, Fifteen years ago, China was about to join the WTO and China was booming. Um, and it was taking off, growing at a double-digit rate. Uh, the, the financial system was healthy. And uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, an agency, a government agency in India invited me over uh, to talk about China's secret. What was China's secret uh, for growing so fast? So I, I showed up, I basically said, uh, yeah, I tell you the secret. The secret is three words. Invest, invest, invest. And they, immediately they told me that China will have a financial crisis. You see, they, they all went to Harvard, so they, they understood the, 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 uh, the, well, how are you going to get, get into trouble. Uh, I said that, yes, China will have a financial crisis. But we go from ground level to 100th floor. Then we have a financial crisis, so it drops to 80th floor. Yeah, okay. So, and if you do not invest, you will always be on the ground level. So this is what, what, what actually I expected how the two countries would, would, would uh, uh, work out. Uh, now partly, uh, uh, the, one important reason was 
that China was governed by engineers at that time. And uh, you know, India, uh, with a uh, uh, much longer history of, uh, of Western, uh, Western, uh, Westernization, uh, is, is governed by uh, lawyers, uh, you know, uh, uh, MBAs, uh, uh, and uh, economists, uh, very similar to here. So China was, it was a very special, uh, uh, very special period. And why uh, invest, 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 that's the East Asian model, why it works? It's because that uh, 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 invest, the, the country development has an economy of scale. When you first build a road, it, it's a, it, 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 it doesn't make money, it loses money. Because that, uh, a road, one road doesn't work, you have to keep building until it, it's a network. One day it booms, you have a huge amount of productivity. So when, during the uh, investment period, you will have an uh, unstable financial system. Because there are, now at that time, I always you know, pay, uh, point out the difference between China and India. When people went to India, they always will lock you up in Taj Mahal and, uh, and, and uh, show you PPT presentation with all the great numbers, return on, uh, on capital, return on equity, cash flow, and so forth. And when you open the window, you see, oh, are these numbers really real? <laughs> But in China, they, they, they always take, uh, to, uh, took you to see all the roads, which spanking new roads, spanking new buildings. They say, it's real, it's, everything is here. Then you look at the books, you say, wow, uh, it's all dead. No, 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 no return. So that's been like, a, but uh, now the investment story, one day, suddenly everything works out. But uh, you, you just have to be persistent and until the system is built. Okay, so that's uh, the sweet spot China reached about uh, a, a, a decade ago. But once you reach the sweet spot, then you, you, you face declining economies of scale because that, uh, once you have uh, the network already built, you build more, then the, the, margin, uh, the, uh, the margin return on capital is declin de de declines. So, but the, the, the problem, why is the Asian countries all running into trouble? inevitable run into financial crisis. It's because that the people who uh, uh, made the country successful will stay on. They will not leave. And they, they only, know what one thing, uh, only know one thing to do. That is to build. They couldn't stop. So that, that, that is uh, the issue we have faced for, uh, for over a decade. And China, actually, the, uh, the economy turned uh, in 2004, uh, and the, uh, the, uh, the labor market was pretty much full. And the, uh, the infrastructure was, uh, was fairly uh, uh, built. Uh, but the government, uh, so the return on capital was declining, but the government used, started to, build, uh, to use a property bubble to, to, to increase savings. The, 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 any bubble in China, the bubble in China is different from in the West. A bubble in China is a tax on the people to subsidize investment. Now, the bubble in, in the United States is like, a, it's basically for people to have a good time, right? You, you, ah, you, are you rich? Borrow some money. You know? So, so uh, at the end of when the bubble bursts, you know, the, uh, I always, uh, uh, when 2008, a lot of people thought Americans were like uh, in a lot of trouble. I, I, I told Chinese people, now, don't, don't feel pain for them. They had a good time. We have never had a good time. So, so, uh, so, uh, so uh, this is basically uh, uh, what's going on, and, uh, and, and they, they use, uh, use bubbles to subsidize the investment. And even though we have obviously, it's uh, not just a return on capital, you can see overcapacity everywhere. So why are you building more? China's own infrastructure industry are much bigger than the United States now. And the economy is only 60% of the level uh, uh, here. And, and the pace that China is building is making another United States every decade. So uh, the, I, I, China will be bigger than the United States. But the issue is the, how much bigger. And you do not have to build so much every year to, to, to make it happen. You have to, the pace has to be much more measured when the system is already built. Now, the, uh, now, we focus on finance because these are the numbers that people understand. But in the background, you always need to remember uh, this is the real story. Because in China, finance is not important because the capital allocation ultimately is determined by political power. 
Okay, so so uh, the uh, so we, uh, you look at the numbers you now. It's uh, that is about three times uh, uh, GDP and uh, growing, and the, the it's now it's growing at uh, six percentage points faster than GDP. So in another five years, it will be four hundred percent. So the we, we talk about that. Uh, the, how high the leverage could be. You know, Japan is, is 400 percent; it's still going. But China, Japan is different. It's uh, they, Jap Japanese people kind of. Uh, I always say Japanese people are kind of like a Titanic people. They they go down with the ship. You know, they they don't take the money out. But Chinese people are not like that. Chinese, China has a very strong government. Chinese people kind of, once they see the situation is not, not good, they all will run away. So, <laughs> so this, this, this is the issue we are facing now, the capital flight. China is running half a trillion dollars in trade surplus. And its currency is going down. And the Communist Party is having meetings how to stop that from, uh, 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 from happening. Because China has got 1.4 billion people, everybody is doing his own thing. Now, it's very difficult to, uh, to stop that, that. So what the government does is usually coming back to this Asian tradition to kill a chicken and shoot to the monkeys. You know, so you, you know, it happened in 2008. Uh, in, in 1998, when China was losing foreign exchange reserve, they arrested a lot of people. And uh, at that time, uh, the punishment was very severe. And <laughs> so uh, now, uh, now it's, it's, it's people are not fearful anymore. China says Chinese system works unfair. You have, it, it, in the last few decades, it last a few five years, you know, nobody g g gets killed for, for being corrupt. And this, is, this system does not work if you like, are so lenient. So, uh, so uh, I, I think that this year something bad will happen to somebody. <laughs> then, then, then the capital flow, outflow may stop. Then the currency will become uh, stable because the, there's no reason for the currency to go down. It's just psychological, and the, it's it's a uh, policy is 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 not 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 a, a well calibrated. Now, why China is likely to have crisis? And I think crisis is not uh, bad for China. China's economic reforms are driven by crisis. What we have today is because of the crisis in 1993. Uh, this inflation crisis, uh, it was a culmination of several episodes of inflation crisis in the 1980s. Then they brought in people, uh, outsiders like Zhu Rongji to run the economy. And Zhu Rongji, over the following decade, instituted a later foundation for China's expansion. It, the basic two tricks. One was to shrink the state sector. The, the second was to open to global capital and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, export market. So these two things that uh, Zhu Rongji did. China, uh, even though China has been considered very successful, but China could be far more successful. The capital income is only $8,000. And Chinese people work much harder than the people here. And, <laughs> and, and I don't understand why you know, Chinese people uh, are not, uh, not having a good time. You know? the, so this is, the real, uh, I think, the, uh, the, the, the crisis the, 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 the case for crisis is really due to this mentality that China can extend the business side, economic cycle. And you can extend the economic cycle with all kinds of tricks. So that means that you do not want to change, right? So that means that the crisis is a matter of time. And the, uh, let's see how uh, they deal with this uh, currency crisis right now. It's, uh, uh, if the foreign trade reserves, foreign trade reserves, uh, uh, vice governor of Central Bank uh, was saying two, two days ago, $3 trillion is still a lot. But actually, it's not about the level, it's about the trend. Chinese people are not, again, back to these Chinese people, Japanese people. Chinese people are always looking at uh, which way the wind is blowing. And just, 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 just Japanese people don't look up, they just look down. They don't know which way the wind is blowing. They, they don't care. So. <clears throat> So, so the, this is like uh, I think that uh, what, what we are at a, a crunch time already. If if China can stop the capital outflow, then the currency, they say, does not go down. What what about the domestic? All these uh, funny trust products, all these shadow banking systems. It's just incredible. And uh, the Chinese China's shadow banking system is a Ponzi scheme. It's it's just a Ponzi. Scheme. It's it's humongous. It's uh, the, we, any sort of uh, risks you're talking about, a mismatch in timing, or these, uh, the, uh, or, or these, uh, the, the duration mismatch, and uh, the, 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 uh, the risk mismatch, people are issuing short-term short, short du duration fixed income IMB products for buying, for taking over US companies. 
So the, the, that kind of uh, thing is, is happening on, on a major scale. Now, all these products are issued because the people expect the government to bail everything out. The whole financial system is based on the expectation the government will bail everybody out. As soon as the government cannot deliver on one case, the you know, Chinese people, again, they see which way the wind is blowing. So if they see that somebody is not bailed out, they're all going to run away. So this is where I see that uh, 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 the, uh, the crisis may be inevitable. inevitable. But when the crisis comes, it, I, would be, I, I think it will be the beginning of, the, uh, of another boom. China is $7,000 per capita income. Chinese people today deserve $20,000 per capita income. And the, the reason why it's so low is because of the inefficiency in the system. The state sector is expanding and, and consuming more and more capital. The same problem that Zhu Rongji dealt with in the 1990s, after Zhu Rongji was gone, it's, it has come back. So this is why I need, maybe have, have, we have another crisis, maybe we'll find another Zhu Rongji. Then uh, here we go again. I stop here. I guess that goes to the, the point that people often make, it. crisis creates opportunity. So you think crisis is a good thing, but nevertheless, we're going to have a looming economic crisis. Arguing against the proposition, uh, we have uh, David Dollar, and uh, please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Really a great pleasure to be here, great pleasure to be on the panel with Andy. Uh, we, we agree on a lot of things, I think, and this proposition is not a slam dunk in either direction, and that's why the initial vote was very close to 50-50. Now, the, probably the main difference I have with Andy is that I'm a strict constructionist, so I look carefully at this sentence, China faces a looming economic crisis. Looming means imminent. Now, to a foreign investor, imminent means in the next three months. Uh, and to me, I have a slightly longer time for horizon. So I interpreted this question, do I think there'll be a visible economic crisis in China before the party Congress in approximately 12 months? And I think, again, it's not a slam dunk, but if I have to bet, I'm going to bet that there will not be an economic crisis in the next 12 months before the party Congress. And I think that that's a useful thing for us to debate. Uh, and then we can spin things out a little bit further uh, into the future. So I wanna make four points. So first, you know, there's a lot of gloomy news coming from China these days, but the first point I wanna make is there's also quite a bit of good economic news coming from China these days. You know, a Andy emphasized Chinese people don't know how to have fun, but so I, I think I don't quite agree with that. Uh, you know, my last few trips around China, I'm struck at how people are out going to restaurants, having malls, of course, driving their cars or not driving them because the traffic has pretty much immobilized everybody. Uh, but the good news, is that consumption is rising at a very healthy rate in China. And you see this both in the national accounts and you see this in surveys. And in, the, in my World Bank experience, we did a lot of work on rural surveys. You're finally seeing really healthy growth in rural consumption, actually slightly faster than urban consumption in recent years. But you know, overall, consumption is growing at about 8%. It's been very consistent. You know, and, and Andy's right, there was this big investment boom. I mean, it went on for a long time, but it accelerated after the global financial crisis. China took its investment rate up to 50% of GDP. So when GDP was growing at 11%, you know, we economists were often commenting that consumption was lagging. It was still growing at 8% back then, but it was a declining share of GDP. The good news is it's continued to grow at about 8%. But GDP growth has slowed down. I'll get to that in a moment. And consumption now is increasing its share of GDP. Now, it's not automatic that this is going to continue. But basically, China does have a virtuous circle going where consumption is rising at a healthy rate. Consumption at China's stage of development is mostly services. So if you look at the GDP data or other data sources, you see services are growing relatively rapidly in China. Industries in a lot of trouble. I'll get to that in a minute. Service sectors are growing. They're more labor intensive. They're creating jobs. And China's demographics have changed. The labor force has actually peaked. And so the labor market is quite tight. 
and that's driving higher wages and driving that consumption. So it's certainly plausible that that consumption engine is going to continue. You know, and the good news I see there, I mean, Chinese people's lives are getting better. That's a great thing to see. Uh, but from an economic point of view, China's getting four to four and a half points of GDP growth. China's a nice, simple economist, economy to ample, uh, analyze mathematically. About half the economy's consumption. So if you grow at 8%, you deliver four percentage points of GDP growth. Okay? Now, this debate would be much easier if Chinese leaders would accept that growing at four and a half or maybe a little bit higher, five, five and a half, if they would accept that growing at that kind of rate uh, with rising consumption and human happiness, that that's a successful position, then this would all be good news. But my second point is, well, there's bad news. The Chinese leaders seem incapable of accepting a five or a 5.5% growth rate. They're determined to hit this arbitrary target of 6.5%. Has nothing to do with creating enough jobs. There's no evidence that looks to any kind of, you know, links to any kind of rational objective. And really the only way, you know, once you've taken account of consumption, what's left then is the increase in net exports. And we're really hoping China is not increasing its net exports because it's got a big surplus and we've got a soft world economy. And just statistically, that's delivered almost nothing for the last few years. So again, the math is simple. You want to grow faster than what you're getting from consumption. It has to come from the growth of investment. And here I can link very nicely to Andy's story. You know, for a long time, there was this big investment boom. And in fact, it generated a lot of productive uh, investments in the World Bank, we financed some of those initial expressways, you know, 20 plus years ago. They just had phenomenal economic rates of return, you know, and actually the Chinese are practical people who charge tolls on those and they were actually extremely profitable. China's one country that took some of the roads we financed, packaged them, sold them on the stock market, used the profits to finance the next stretch of roads. So there was a long stretch where this investment strategy generated high productivity and high profitability for individual companies. But I agree with Andy, that, that kind of ran out of steam within the last few years. And you see now declining profitability of companies. You see declining profitability, uh, productivity as measured in the national accounts. Excess capacity, very visible in sectors like steel. Uh, housing in third and fourth tier cities, they seem to have way overbuilt the housing stock. And I would argue that we've reached a point where a lot of the infrastructure investments are not productive. So you have these famous you know, bridges to nowhere. Uh, on one of my recent trips uh, out in the far west, a uh, local official was showing me it wasn't quite a bridge to nowhere, but it was a bridge more or less over a sand gully. You know, so I said I didn't quite understand the logic of the bridge. And he said, don't worry, the five-year plan includes a river. <laughs> <laughs> So build a bridge, build a river, but you can see you're going to start getting very poor economic returns. That, that's what we see in the data. Uh, and, and so China's able to grow. You know, I think there's a little bit of bias in their data, but they're able to grow at about 6.5, but they're doing it by issuing a lot of credit. It's taking more and more credit to generate investment, which has a weaker and weaker return. So when people throw these statistics at you, rising debt to GDP, you know, what it means is, they're actually issuing credit at about the same rate they have for a long time. And, and actually, I think it's generating a fair amount of investment. It's just the investment has very little return. And so the denominator there, you know, GDP, is just not going up very rapidly. Credit's still going up, but GDP is not going up. So they're, they're kind of pushing on a string. And so this is where you get the fear of a crisis. They are now flashing red on some of the classic indicators uh, in this debt to GDP area, I particularly like the Bank for International Settlement does a calculation where they look at the extent to which you're getting out ahead of trend. And if you're 10 percentage points of GDP out ahead of trend, that's a great predictor of the US financial crisis. Sorry, not so much the US because we weren't bank finance, but Spain, East Asian financial, et cetera. China's at 30 percentage points above trend, okay? Another warning indicator the IMF likes is looking at your ratio of M2, so how much credit stock you've pushed out relative to your gross reserves. As Andy said, Governor Yi was saying 3.1 trillion is still a lot of reserves. Well, actually, that ratio of M2 to, to uh, reserves has risen up to about seven, and the IMF warning indicator is five. 
okay? So lots of things flashing warning signs, okay? Now my third point is, I th you know, I'm the one who argued they don't have a looming financial crisis, so I wanted to paint a fairly stark picture because I think that is all real, but I don't think it adds up to an economic crisis in the next year because there are special features of the Chinese economy that work against the economic crisis. And in particular, this is still an economy with a lot of state intervention, state-owned banks lending to state-owned companies. A lot of that credit buildup is state-owned banks lending to state-owned companies. And it's a country with capital controls. They've just tightened up the capital controls. So as we observe this over the next year, to me, an interesting question is going to be, can they really make those capital controls bite? Uh, that's going to be a key issue. I'm guessing yes for the next year. Uh, and if you think there's going to be a crisis sooner than that, the most likely version would be some kind of exchange rate crisis. But those of you who know China well, if you think through some of the ways these economic crises unfold, you know, the classic one in the banking system would, you know, they're now lending money to a lot of zombie firms that are basically dead. The classic crisis would be banks start to go bankrupt, and in that environment, and firms start to go bankrupt, in that environment, the, re the remaining banks, they don't understand, like, who are good clients, who are bad clients. They stop lending even to the good clients. That's why you get such a sharp drop in capitalist economies. Well, in China, I'm pretty sure as banks go, you know, some banks go bankrupt and non-performing loans build up, they're going to tell those state-owned banks to keep lending, particularly to state-owned companies and local governments. Not a good outcome, but it's going to prevent an economic crisis. And I think they can make their capital controls effective. And I keep emphasizing this one-year issue because some of the officials I talked to recently emphasized that any big transfer, they know perfectly well who's doing it. <laughs> And so you have to ask yourself, you're a big, wealthy, private sector person, and you have to ask, do you want to be identified as a person who moved a large amount of money out of the country, perhaps embarrassed Xi Jinping during this key political year, you know, bringing about kind of a self-fulfilling exchange rate devaluation? So when I add it all up, I think their various distortions will keep them from having a financial crisis in the next year, but all of those are throwing sand in the wheels of the economy, so the economy is likely to slow down. And then just very briefly, fourth point, you know, they really need bold reform to move kind of healthy, you know, healthier, sustainable growth path. Keep that consumption going, you know, but with a smaller, healthier amount of investment. They need to close the zombie firms. They need to clean up the non-performing loans, ideally bring private capital into the financial system. And one of my big issues, they still have very closed and restricted service sectors. I talked about how that's been a leading growth area for them, but those are actually uncompetitive, unproductive sectors. They would do better if they opened up the service sector. So a bold agenda. I don't see President Xi doing these things even after a year from now. I guess I'm skeptical that we're suddenly going to see a lot of bold reform. So as you go further out, the answer to this question becomes obvious. You know, any market economy has a high probability of a financial crisis over a five-year time period. Like if we ask, do we think there'll be a five, the financial crisis during the Trump administration, that would be an interesting one to take a vote on. Uh, so as you, go out, as you go out five years, the probabilities start rising, and I would probably vote differently if we were taking, say, a five-year time period. But if you're looking at the next year and then maybe two years, I still come down on, I don't see a looming financial crisis. Thank you very much. So before I open up the floor for questions, I am going to give Andy a an opportunity, because we did not define the time frame. Um, looming, I don't know, I don't, probably would not have said imminent next three months, uh, but you work for hedge funds, so maybe that's your definition as well. But I wanted to give you an opportunity to perhaps uh, explain to everybody what time frame perhaps you have in your mind. When do you see China um, experiencing an economic crisis? I think that uh, the first opportunity is before the 19th Party Congress. Now, mo the market consensus is that China will try to delay the crisis mm -hmm. before the ne next Party Congress. And I, 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 f I feel that there is a case uh, for the opposite, because that, uh, some sort of crisis will, will make it easier for personal changes 
in the 19th Party Congress, and uh, you can start, uh, uh, you, you can give the next government much better, uh, much better hand to, to deal with the situation. So this is where I think that the, uh, uh, this is the first point. But if, if, if the, uh, the, the, uh, the crisis uh, doesn't happen uh, next year, then the second, uh, and the second opportunity is uh, the year after, that's 2018. Uh, the new guy, uh, uh, let's assume there will be some new faces in the, at, the, at the top level. That would be a great opportunity to just to, to, to clean the house and uh, blame all the other guys. Uh, I, I was, in 2013, I thought there was a great opportunity for the new government to do that. For some reason, they didn't do it. And, uh, they, it's not good for them. Why didn't they do it? And then it's become, it's become, it has become their problem. So I think that uh, it's not a five year. If, if we're talking about five years away, the people in charge are completely have to own the problem. They, they will not solve that. They will try to delay that. So that will be very bad for China. I think the worst case for China is, is just uh, <clears throat> just uh, go back to these draconian measures to lock people up and uh, to prevent a crisis, right? So that means stagnation or stagflation uh, and, and, uh, uh, and eventually it leads to social instability. Okay. I'd like to give all of you the opportunity to uh, pose some questions to our speakers. Um, where do we have? Okay, so um, we'll start right here, and then we'll go in the back and over to Bert Keitel. So three on this side of the room first. Thank you. Uh, Thomas McCabe, former DOD. Uh, this is a question I've had for a long time. The Chinese report economic growth of about 6.5% a year. Is it actually six and a half percent a year, or is that a basically a quota that they are told to report whether they actually reach it or not? The age-old question of the reliability of Chinese economic statistics. Okay, in the back. Um, Augustus Alzona, federal, uh, former Federal Reserve Board employee. Um, the question I have is, uh, you mentioned the, well, in terms of the uh, looming economic crisis, uh, in your opinions or the opinions of the panel, what sort of effect, uh, negative or positive, uh, if any, would uh, uh, the looming rise in interest rates as forecasted by the Fed, I believe, which the stock market and markets, financial markets have already adjusted for up, uh, in the upcoming uh, six months or so. And you know, as those of you who are well-versed in macroeconomics, there's usually an 18-month lag between Fed actions and the overall effect on the underlying uh, economy of, of the U.S. And so what impact, if anything, uh, could or do you think this would have on the uh, uh, on the Chinese economy. Bert Keitel over there. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Albert Keitel, the Atlantic Council. Um, one question for each of you. Andy, you, you mentioned the economic cycle and that it will crash and then come back again, but China inflation now is very low. Uh, it seems to me that, if anything, it's sort of at a, at a nadir in what we've seen in the cyclical movement of the Chinese GDP growth. So I just wonder what makes you think that it's uh, sort of at the top of the cycle and at the, and rather than at the bottom and waiting for better global conditions and, and uh, policies after the new party Congress. And uh, David, you, uh, you mentioned the uh, ineffectiveness of investment and how it's over-investment and demand and the, uh, there's oversupply and excess capacity, uh, but we heard about that in the 1990s as well, when the problem wasn't sort of too much capital stock. The problem was, was weak demand as they tried to deal with this state-owned enterprise problem in the 1990s. And China's per capita capital stock, I think, is still under 15% of the U.S. level. So there is lots of need for productive capital if they're going to raise their standard of living. So why aren't we now seeing, again, another nadir in demand that seems to be misinterpreted as uh, overcapacity. Okay, let's start with those first, and then we can come back for another round. Um, do you want to start? 
Yeah, let me <clears throat> deal with this economic cycle and the stock of capital. I think a lot of people uh, uh, have these uh, arguments. The, uh, the economic cycle uh, is very overextended. And uh, China should have adjusted in 2000, 2008. It was a great opportunity to adjust. Instead, China created this massive uh, credit bubble, quadrupled credit. Uh, to, to extend the cycle. And the, 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 the cost for extending the cycle is so high, so that's why we are talking about a crisis right now. So these, this is a, a technical perspective. On this issue of uh, uh, look, uh, compare uh, China and the United States in, t in terms of uh, uh, capital stock per, uh, per capita, I think this uh, comparison is probably not valid for many reasons. The United States, uh, is underpopulated, very large country. So uh, it's uh, been accumulating capital for 200 years. So that's the reason why uh, Americans uh, have so much capital stock. And uh, in the case of China, China is uh, Chinese people live in big cities, uh, living uh, in apartment blo blocks. The ultimate, ultimate capital requirement to have the same living standard is very low. You, if you compare Japan to the United States, uh, you, have, you, you find only the same, dip, same difference. So in that regard, China's uh, eventually capital efficiency should be much higher than here because of uh, the, uh, the different type of uh, uh, urbanization. And, uh, the, and also, the, uh, when you have too much investment, by definition, you will have insufficient consumption. So how could you factories, you, if you build factories, on the demand of building more factories. And one day, you, 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 you run into a wall. That's what we're seeing in, uh, in a lot of uh, commodity industry, like in the steel industry. How can you build more, st uh, uh, build more steel mills to increase demand for steel? Uh, that story is not going to last. Ultimately, you have to balance between the consumption and investment. Do you want to comment on the reliability of Chinese economic statistics? Uh, I always say that China's Statistics Bureau is sort of like uh, uh, the CF, CFO of a major multinational company. They smooth the curve, you know. <laughs> so so, uh, so uh, uh, for a number of years, they understated uh, economic uh, uh, growth data. And then uh, now they are overstating the, uh, somewhat. Uh, there's a, a pickup. Uh, I look at, uh, tend to look at energy consumption as, uh, because China is an industrial economy. Uh, 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 no, consumption may be picking up a little, but it uh, still does not drive the economy. So uh, the, uh, uh, after the property uh, boomed, we see, we, we see that a major pickup in energy consumption. So that means the economy in the last couple of quarters has is, is ticked up a lot. But the issue is that uh, since 2012, the cycle is very short. You have a pickup in the economy, then you, you slide. It's because that it's, the cycle is being extended artificially with government uh, measures. So this is uh, the, uh, but uh, this, when China is uh, like, uh, uh, the cycle is, is not good, this, uh, China is, uh, the view towards China is not good. Some extreme view will view China's whole economic development is a hoax. Uh, yeah, I was in Japan talking to a lot of Japanese people say, uh, they, they, they like to hear this story that China's development is not real, so we don't have nothing to worry about. <laughs> That, that is uh, totally wrong. Uh, Chinese, uh, China will become uh, the, by far the largest economy in the world. 800 million people working, working much harder than anywhere else. And the Chinese people on average are better educated than anywhere else. So I don't see how can you, the economy is not going to be the largest in the world. So this is sort of, uh, uh, I, I think that the economic development is definitely real. Just, just uh, it faces uh, a major challenge in, in, uh, in transforming the economy to a more balanced, and China needs to learn how to, uh, how to consume to become uh, uh, the final source of demand instead of uh, just talking about it being the center of a supply chain. That, that is very vulnerable. If you become the final source of demand, then people respect you. If you just export and uh, take other people's money away, the people are going to be negative about you. So all these talk about a strategic competition. I think it's all going to go away if China doubles its economy and becomes the largest import market in the world. Why would we be talking about all those issues? About people naturally want to kiss up to China. You don't have to force people to kiss up to you. They will, they will kiss up to you voluntarily. So don't try too hard. 
it over to you. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so uh, on the data issue, I think the, ba the data are basically okay. There's so many different data sources you could look at. It would just be too big an effort to try to, you know, to doctor all of that. I think that in a you know, relatively a fast growing period, they tend to understate growth because they oversample state enterprises and undersample the private sector. And now that things are slowing down, they probably overstate the data, overstate growth a little bit because they oversample state enterprises. But yeah, I'm not, I don't expect this to be anywhere near a percentage point. So I think basically we can rely on their data to show us the broad trends. Question about the Fed is very interesting. You know, ch Chinese investors seem to be very worried about this, and, and uh, you know, they seem quite spooked with the idea that U.S. interest rates are going to return to normal. If the Fed does a good job and this is all returning to normal because the U.S. economy is performing in a healthy, normal way, you know, that should be fine. But when you've got a lot of nervousness, sometimes, sometimes a somewhat exogenous event you know, can trigger uh, you know, capital flight or other types of, of uh, hurting behavior. So it is, it, it is kind of nerve wracking watching what's happened as the Fed raises rates or talks about raising its rate and how, how China responds. I happen to think there's room for China to increase its interest rates because uh, I think that they really should buy into this transition to a more consumption driven growth. Uh, and you know, devaluation of the exchange rate makes people poorer. And so I think, uh, you know, and, and part of that deleveraging, you know, has to involve raising the cost of capital, I think. Then the third is on, you know, Bert, I, I, we talk about this more offline, but, you, you know, the fact that eventually China may be successful, eventually China may double its capital stock compared to today, that doesn't mean it's economic to do it in one year. You know, and when you invest, I mean, the, and the data are just very clear that there used to be pretty high profitability in Chinese corporates, and there used to be pretty high productivity as measured in the national accounts. Now that's all collapsed. You know, so you've got a consistent story. It was fine to be investing 30% or so of GDP, but you take that up to 50%, and then you're creating capital stock too quickly. And there's not enough demand for it, so it's just not profitable investment, even if it's something that the country's going to need in the long run. Okay, we'll take a few more questions before we vote. Yes, over here. Thanks. Gentlemen, and wait for the microphone, please. It's on its way. Hi, uh, my name is Anupam Khanna. I'm visiting from India. In India, also, we have this complex, you know, always waiting for maybe China to falter. But I keep telling people it's not going to happen. <laughs> Uh, that's my bias. I worked at the World Bank when we went through all these crises, the Asian with David and, uh, of course, uh, Gojong had already left by that time. But the question always is, when does the crisis start? Now, as you know, just like we dating of recession becomes an industry, that's, in some ways, I'm hearing both of you say looming means something has started. But I think the more precise question and the more important one is, how, what is going to be the depth of the crisis? Is it going to be a crash? Is it going to be a hard landing? Or is it going to be bumpy? And to me, it seems both of you are really talking about a bumpy uh, situation. Certainly not one uh, that Bonnie, when she said was, is there going to be a crisis that will the ma party can manage or not? So am I correct in your saying that this, whatever happens, the party will be able to manage, manage it? I, I think so, but I would like to hear from you. The question then becomes, and this is the point that Gojong, again, uh, Andy said, that uh, you know, the difference in the past, from the past to this time is, in the past, the economic portfolio was typically not in the hand of the general secretary. In 1989, Zhao Ziyang was dismissed. His portfolio, economic portfolio was taken away from him eight months before he was dismissed. So the question at this time is the first time for a long time the C is supposed to be actually pretty much having very direct reins of the portfolio, economic portfolio. So if there is a crisis, how will the politics work out? And could there be a political crisis? And that will be the question. Or are you thinking there will not be a political crisis? Sorry, it's somewhat long-winded arc. <laughs> Good questions, though. Um, Scott Kennedy, hold that thought. Thank you. Um, I'm really confused, uh, which is not uncommon. 
Uh, but but Andy is the happiest go lucky crisis welcomer that I've ever found, and and David is the most pessimistic uh, person who's ever who thinks a crisis isn't going to happen. So at least in terms of temperament, uh, the, the the difference is, is is startling. So I wanted to give you both a chance to sort of. Uh, Sort of like the you know, sort of freaky Tuesday, go or go back to the other side. So, for, so for David, uh, if wonder if you could be a little bit more optimistic. Andy Rothman has talked about, uh, and others about the um, successful restructuring of the economy already. The movement towards services away from industry. Um, his most recent essay talks uh, says that there isn't a housing bubble, and provides a lot of data uh, to suggest that. So. Are you willing to be a little bit more optimistic than just saying the crisis is at least not going to occur within the next 12 months? Might you think that maybe there's actually they're doing some things right that are addressing some of the fundamental challenges? And for, for Andy, I guess my, my question is, you know, what is the mechanism uh, for a crisis to unfold? Because um, you say that uh, people can run, but they're going to run into walls. Right. So they're going to run if they take money out of the Chinese banks, Chinese government can just close the banks. Uh, if they try and take the money out of the country, they are asserting capital controls. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I, su I suppose if, if inflation were to come along, then the money that they did have would shrink in value. But as Bert said, uh, there's not a big inflation problem right now. So it seems to me that the only possible, that the most likely I'll, I'll possibility of a crisis is if they try to reform the way you suggest they do, which is to liberalize and then to inv and and to make the uh, financial system operate on a commercial basis where there are winners and lots of losers, in which case then people would take the signal that they ought to run for the exits and then there'd be lots of problems. So wouldn't the solution you're suggesting actually be the most likely route to a crisis than all the other things that, that could happen? Okay. I think we've got enough questions. We're going to go back to our panelists um, before we vote. Um, David, why don't you start? Right. So, Scott, I think you picked up something, you know, you know interesting in that uh, you know, I can share with Andy's sense that, you know, Christ, crisis is not necessarily the worst thing in the world. You know, sure, it'd be nice if your policy could anticipate and avoid it, you know, but capitalism is prone to cycles. Um, so having some kind of down cycle in China is not necessarily a bad thing. And if they responded to that with a lot of vigorous reform, uh, you know, that, that could be a good scenario. So thinking there might be a crisis is not necessarily pessimistic if you're you know, if you care about China in the medium to long term. I, on the other hand, find it very hard to be optimistic these days. So, I mean, in the, I've been negative about, you know, China's economic reform for, for at least a year, if, if not longer. So when this debate came up, I thought long and hard about that. And as I said, I focused very much on this idea, do, do I think there's going to be a crisis within the next year is what I really focused on. And I thought my honest answer is no, I don't think there'll be one within the next year, but I, you know, I find it hard to be optimistic. Now, you know, some people are hoping that after the next party Congress, there's a new lineup. You know, maybe C will put a lot of people in place in the Central Committee and various key government posts. Uh, you know, I would love to see that. I've been waiting for serious reform in China for a long time, so I would love to see it. I just find it hard to be optimistic. Um, and then Anupam, you, I, you know, I, I'm an economist, as you know, so we're not necessarily the best people to answer these questions. Uh, I think, to link a little bit to the last panel, you know, while we're talking about China's policy, what the U.S. does is going to be very important. And so if the U.S. is perceived as pursuing a kind of hostile trade policy toward China, starting a tr trade war in the, in the language of the press, and then it happens, and perhaps unrelated, that China has an economic crisis over the next 12 months, that, of course, will play into the hands of China's leaders, because I think Chinese people will respond very nationalistically to any kind of, of uh, perceived trade attack from the United States. On the other hand, you know, if our relations are solid, if global relations or global economy is doing pretty well and China just manages to fall off the table because a lot of the things I said were wrong, you know, then it's hard for me to see that Chinese people wouldn't blame Xi Jinping, who's taken you know, all the different powers onto his own self, but not a political scientist, so not the best person to answer that. We will have one last proposition after our break on uh, politics and the political systems. Maybe we can talk more about that. Andy, hard landing? Uh, 
I think that uh, the uh, China uh, in the last 30 years uh, also always had a hard landing. <laughs> no exception. Because the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the Chinese mentality of uh, 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 stretching the cycle is not new. So uh, I, I, that's why I think that the, uh, it will be a hard landing. Now, the trigger would be, I think, the, uh, will be in the property market. China's uh, the, uh, the new property sales this year would likely be like 17, 18% of GDP. It's just uh, un never happened in the history of the world. And uh, empty flats, at least 50 million. And another 50 million under construction. We always talk about a lot of people in China, but if we're talking about 100 million flats, you cannot find enough people to, 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 to stay in those flats. So the, uh, so and the, the, in terms of the price level, relative price, price to wage, price to uh, household income is higher than Japan at, at its peak. And uh, like Shanghai, Beijing, and, and Shenzhen put together, their properties are worth a whole lot more than in the United States, as a, the whole United States. So uh, we, we're back to the, the, uh, the story that we had 20 years ago uh, in Japan. So the, uh, the, uh, something will happen. Let's say interest rate would have to go up, because that if you want to defend the currency, you have to raise interest rate. If you raise interest, the property market goes down. When the property market goes down, all, all the loans, half of the loans are related to the property sector. They have to, they, 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 then they have to be marked down. So you have a, a, a you have basic NPL crisis. And in 1998, Zhu Rongji set up all these bad banks, uh, bad banks uh, to to handle that. And uh, I don't know how they are going to handle these uh, uh, this time. But the scale this time is much much bigger. So that's sort of a, I th I see how uh, the trigger in terms of the right policy response is to expand the fiscal deficit enormously to like a. Five or six or seven percent of GDP doesn't really matter, and uh, the sh investment will shrink quite a lot, uh, as it should be, uh, as it happened after the Asian financial crisis in Korea. Then you try to keep the consumption going by through fiscal support. Then uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, the, uh, the economy, uh, the, uh, at least uh, uh, politically, socially, it's going to be stable. So I I think that uh, if we have uh, united leadership, that's. This is the response I, I expect. In terms of, uh, are we going to get into, like Anuban's question, getting to political crisis? And uh, first, uh, I think the Communist Party will still be running things. If I say something different, different, I'll be in jail. No. <laughs> so, uh, and, and I, I, I do believe that uh, that's uh, like to be the case. I, 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 I think that uh, there's, uh, uh, no. Uh, China is about money. There's a lot of money going around, so uh, political struggle is no longer life and death. You know, so they don't kill each other anymore. Not like like uh, uh, thirty years ago, there was no money. The only instrument they had was to kill each other. Now, they, now, now, there's a lot of money. So I, I, I think eventually, eventually there will be a compromise. We will go, we will have a, a, a consolidated, coherent leadership uh, to help us get through this. Well, this has been a very interesting debate. Um, we're going to now, of course, I think we can clarify that our proposition is China faces an economic crisis before the 19th Party Congress. I think that's been the distinction uh, that has been made between our two speakers, um, with uh, Andy Sia arguing yes in favor and uh, David Dollar arguing against. So I'm asking all of you to please vote. Do you agree with the proposition? Do you disagree? Please make sure that your vote is actually entered. If you turn on the clicker. There will be a green power light that will be on if that clicker is working. Do you get an electric shock if you vote twice? Um, no. <laughs> if you vote twice, it only registers once. Uh, you only get one vote, but I hope you will all use that one vote. It's your civic duty to vote in a democracy, you know. Uh, 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 Scott, you cannot take three different <laughs> clickers. <laughs> that would work, but we will not allow it. All right, everybody gets one vote. There are extra clickers around, but we're going to make sure that you don't use them. Okay, so everybody has registered their vote. We started out with 43% agreeing, and now we have 29% agreeing. And we have, what is that, 68 I think, I think 66, 66% 66. <laughs> 66 disagreeing. So the disagree has increased significantly. This has been a terrific debate. Please join me in thanking David Dollar and Andy Sia.
So we now have a 15-minute break, but please come back.